Welcome to another episode of the Carbon Life Pods. It's been a while. Um, the guest who we have on today, if you've listened to the podcast before, you may or may not remember him, but I'm going to ask him to introduce himself again. All right, right mate. I can uh, see good, you. Up, good afternoon to the uh, Carbon Life Pod community. Uh, thank, thank you so much again, uh, Desires, for this opportunity. Um, and, and thank you also for the trip to Amsterdam. I'm uh, Ian Simpson. Uh, I have a background uh, in the world of business and finance, and over the last six years, I've immersed myself in the Bitcoin and crypto community, um, which has been an amazing journey, and uh, to share it with Josias has uh, been fantastic. So uh, thank you again, Josias, for the invitation. That's 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 perfectly um, okay, mate. So we said at the start of the call, well, we have a lot to talk about. Previously on Conversations, we had one on the 13th of December, and then we had another one on the 5th of January, so 5th, 13th of December 2021, then January the 5th, 2022, we split the conversation in two, it was titled Two Bad Deeds. I remember um, it well. Yeah, so if you know who know, trying to be hip, you have a bad B, which is a bad bitch. We were dads, because that's how we met through dads of footballers, so we were two bad deeds. Um, I propose a new name for this episode, uh, I hope Ian will agree with me, but I want to call it Two Bad Maxis. Oh, that's pushing <laughs> your luck a little bit. <laughs> but 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 we'll get to we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, Can we call it one and a half? One and a half, possibly, possibly. But the reason why I was so excited to do this call again, we spoke. There was there was a lot for us to speak about. We've been to Amsterdam for the Bitcoin conference. I'm annoyed that we didn't do it last week when it was planned. Unfortunately, with my new Fiat job, I had to, as a manager, cover somebody. Um, but it would have been before the pump that we've. Um, experience in the last couple of days so it would have been a really good conversation before that Definitely. now I, I don't i don't want it to seem like we are riding the wave riding the wave so to speak but um i wanted to refer back to a message somebody sent me after our first podcast and i've never told you about this year so it's gonna be a total surprise to you ouch and, and you're gonna let me know what you think but it's funny how let's say the universe work how time tells a story so somebody reached out to me after the first conversation, scrolling back, mate, listen to a couple of cob of carbon lives now. Great effort. Can already tell the production value has gone up and great work on the coin corner sponsor. Nearly finished your latest episode, but geez, I had to stop. I've got a bone or two to pick with Mr. Simpson about this bloody crypto and NFTs. <laughs> Bring it on. So I responded. Cheers, mate. I listened back to one of the first ones and did cringe. We must, uh, this This is my episode I'm talking about, not yours yeah. yet. And I said, lol, we've just recorded another episode today. And we went head to head again. From knowing his backstory, I appreciate, understand his angle, trying to make up for lost time. Plus, he's sort of a boomer with an institutionalized, albeit liberal mindset. <laughs> there, there, listen, it goes on. It's funny because we've both, we're both trying to con convert the other whilst maintaining a great social relationship. He'll be taking on responsibilities for that particular podcast now as a sort of project for a group he works with. I may drop an episode here and there on my platform, but not too often. Need to stay on mission. Then he responded, yeah, it's all good. I've gone in a bit tough on him. I think I just see it that, and please don't take this the wrong way. Just not sure how else to word it. He's a bit of a salesman selling this snake oil trying to cash in. <laughs> if he was in recruitment and had a successful business, then he was good at sales, period. Now, if he's moving on to other things like crypto and NFTs, it's a perfect marketplace for a salesman. I would also go at him with a comment. We are changing the money and changing the world whilst you guys are playing around with trying to sell digital Pokemon cards. And as I say, all this is meant with due respect and it's just my opinion. He is quite rightly allowed to do, so, do said gambling and building. It's just Bitcoin is on a different and I would argue more meaningful mission. Christ, that sounded a bit preachy. I get down from my high horse now. Then I responded, say, no, I love it. And that's my exact sentiment towards him. To be fair, I'll share the latest episode with you once released. You can let me know if I let him off too lightly or if I landed my subtle points enough. <laughs> well, that, was, that was January 2022. Okay, so we had a bit of time to prepare. <laughs> well, so over, over to you. There was a lot to digest to take in there. But um, well, if you just I, want to talk about your experience at, at the conference. Well, let's go back. And, and, and how, how, you, how you ended up there. Because <laughs> I wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> yeah, no, well, just going back to what um, one of the, the, the carbon followers mentioned there, 
and probably now just trying to make my view a little bit clearer. Um, being a sort of macro guy, as you know I am, I totally understand the power of Bitcoin, the movement, what it's trying to achieve. And, and you know um, the documentary that I referred you to just last week after the conference really resonated with me and, and, and really sort of um, completed my cycle of, of studying over the last five or six years. But one thing I won't do, I won't dive in headfirst to any one particular pillar of expertise at the expense of losing out on all the other things that are happening. Now, I, I, I do believe that Bitcoin does have a fantastic movement and I can understand why um, it, you're incentivized by it after watching uh, the Zeitgeist documentary where this conversation was started. I totally get now um, why you've immersed yourself within it because it is the answer to all the things that were discussed within Zeitgeist and also all the things have been discussed in the Third Industrial Revolution by Joe Marifkin, which I know is another documentary that we've both watched and shared. But I can't get away from the fact there are opportunities in crypto where innovation is taking place. I don't believe Bitcoin will be the only blockchain, but I do believe it's the most purest one at the moment. And with the stuff that Nathaniel Cole posted before the Bitcoin London conference that happened last week, I was very amazed at the amount of projects that are now running on the Lightning Network. But one thing I really struggled with that Bitcoin will have a great deal of value, you know, and, and, and we won't be around maybe in the next hundred years to see what it really grew to, but we may see the next 30 or 40 if God spares us. And, and yeah, that, that concept of what Bitcoin is doing and what it could possibly do to the world as we know it. Um, it is the movement for a better world. So I, I'm just I'm just keeping fingers in as many pies as possible because I, I, I honestly can't see the total outcome of, of how this world may look in 30, 40, 50 years' time. There is so much going on, and it truly is a total reset across everything. Um, and no matter what rabbit hole you go down, you're starting to define different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle which, could, which will create this new world, this new economy going forward. So to the community of um, Carbon Lifepod listeners, if it's possible, can I be a maximalist? But at the same time, <laughs> keep, keep, keep a foot within the rest of the activity that's going on. And, and for those who listen to the podcast regularly, they know I use the um, term, the cat can't dismiss the internet. Uh, I can't dismiss anything you're saying. These are your experiences from from your... And you're talking from your, your learning, your standing point. For me personally, I would say the rabbit holes I've I've been down, it, for me, it all comes back to the money. And if the money's not right, if the money's not sound, with hence the term, we have the terminology sound money, which came from when you tap gold, it makes a certain sound. If we don't have sound money, anything built on top of that has a an attack vector or point of failure. Yep. Um, so Bitcoin for me, as the soundest money, as a technology, that's why I... I talk about all the time, why I build my business off of it, and also why you mentioned about the Lightning layer. For me, when I got into the Bitcoin space, Lightning was already around, albeit new. And I still to speak to people now who've been in Bitcoin many, many years and don't know anything about Lightning. I'm amazed because I'm thinking, I see so much on the Lightning, and you mentioned there's more to come. We went to the conference, and I was amazed by what's being built on it. But yet people who are, say, maxis or Bitcoiners for for maybe 10 years, still don't know what the light, what Lightning has to offer. So there is so much potential out there. But for me, again, I've so, we've spoken about it before. I have chosen not to spend my time, which I see as valuable, focusing on other projects that will take me away. You, from your experience, you said keeping a, a, a one foot in the, um, in another, another, what do you call it? One foot in the other, call it the land? Yeah, the sort of, I suppose, yeah. the, crypt, the crypto world. Yeah, and it, yeah one know, foot in the crypto big, world. I know your Bitcoin maxes will we'll call it, you know, two coins. coins. Yeah, yeah coins. Okay. Yeah. I know I can yeah. say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> keeping it above board, um, which, I, which I also get because, yeah, I, I get that. But mm. I, and I'm, yeah, for one better but, word, I'm, I'm challenged by the fact that, that, that this thing called Bitcoin is going to be such a massive store of value 
And I'm totally sold and bought into that concept after listening to that previous documentary by Mr. Booth. That why am I ever going to want to spend it when it's potentially so great? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But um, I wanted to mention, so you talk about other projects, and you, you use the term sandbox, which I don't think I'd heard before. Um, and it became apparent when we were in Amsterdam because you were talking, we were talking about NFTs before. I've looked at NFTs. I, I did some when the wave came and see them go up and down in value and the, the kind of hype go away. But when we met the, our guys who were doing the ordinals and obviously people in the Bitcoin space saw NFTs and saw ordinals and saw the, what happened with ordinals when people were putting pictures on the blockchain and it was increasing fees for transactions. But having sat down and met with the guys who were creating ordinals for artwork. The generative um, art guys. Penny yeah, guys, that's right. right yeah. yeah. It was like, wow, now I understand your use case. I understand how it can work. People that came before just trying to make a bit quick buck, but you guys are actually working on something that is sustainable and a project that not saying it will everyone would take on board, but it will be a niche market. Um, so yeah, it's always a case of you have to speak with people that are doing something, listen to them, understand where they're coming from. You may not agree with them, but by listening, you may understand it a little bit better. And when I walked away from that ordinals chat, I was like, wow, now I, now I get it. Yeah. Now I get it. And I, I think that, was, that, I think, that was the yeah. NFTs though, wasn't it? So NFTs yeah. that were, weren't on Bitcoin now has been transferred over onto ordinals and it's been shown it's got a UK use case. So yeah, you talking about, crypto as the sandbox yeah but i i i argue like i said it before the twenty thousand coins that may have a use case i i don't, I don't want to spend my time and energy looking into one of maybe them but you you you, you, you i've seen how you work you narrow things down you pick winners um so yeah i like your strategy but for me yeah focusing on on the bitcoin and i suppose this, this confrontation we're kind of starting to meet in the middle and and, and you're right i think if you, if you can't spend the time or you don't have the time to look into something, then you end up like the majority of the world at the moment that read the strap lines about Bitcoin when all the powers that be, for want of a better word, the money masters are publishing things on their media pipes about it's too volatile, it's too this, you know. Right, bad for the environment. Right, and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. When, when we know, because we've done the deep dive on it, that, that the community is working really hard on ESG models that are going to drive um, the future mining of, of Bitcoin and maybe other cryptos, which kind of dovetails me into another question. Um, with our discussion on the last uh, Bitcoin being mined around about <laughs> 20... <laughs> Stacey, that. I was like, this guy, he is. He doesn't know his stuff. He does research. But you're not, the, you're not the first person to say that. So somebody said to me, I'm going to buy Bitcoin at £10,000 and uh, the last Bitcoin be mined in in 10 years i'm like what are you talking about where are those numbers from <laughs> but again it goes into what you know what you understand and exactly. i can see i can see how that can get missed when you read the number um yeah oh yeah 2140 is the last no 2040 no no 2140 this is this has got longevity over Long 100 longevity. years <laughs> yeah and it's quite it's quite interesting with the halving process that's been put into the model and design you know you go back to the first four year cycle when it was 50 BTC 50, for one 50 block. 50 Bitcoin right? block, yeah. And, for, and 16 years down the line, you know, approaching the fourth halving, we're now down at, what, 0. 0.6? Is Six, it? Six, six, six yeah. Two five. Yeah. 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 Which, is, which is interesting. But it did, it, it, see, all of this is discovery, and I absolutely love it. My, my brain is so hungry for this. Um, I feel like I'm doing a lifetime degree. But I did but it is, that. you do get it, don't you? It's like a, a quest for, for knowledge. I think we spoke about yeah. it before. On the yeah. Board. And why wouldn't you want to? Because the answers are out there now. Thank, thank goodness for the internet and the ability and, to... and freely available as well. Exactly. There's no excuse now why one can't build their knowledge just by having that discovery mindset. Turn off terrestrial TV. Turn off the Netflix. Maybe a movie every now and again. <laughs> maybe the Premier League just to keep your feet on the ground. Yeah. But you know, once you get into YouTube and podcasts, it's like there is no ending and. And the beautiful thing is, you may have to watch quite a few videos that aren't really impacting you to find that one that really gives you that jump up to the next level, that, mm. that puts another jigsaw piece in the puzzle that helps was, you build that clear picture. Was it the uh, saying, isn't there? Forget the noise, find the signal. And yeah. That's exactly that. You'll watch yeah. lots of videos and you'll find out, actually, where, where is this taking me? Where's the source? Yeah. And you know, I'm a big believer in the universe, right? And, and, and the universe 
always benefits the trier. And I constantly look back every week and, and coming off the, the Amsterdam trip and the, the Bitcoin conference, I got so many wins after that. I'm like, that's like a reward for being at that conference. It's building on that information that gathered. And you, you watch that documentary as well. And, and for me, that, that really resonated with me and it gave me a whole new picture. It just reinforced what we'd heard in, in Amsterdam and obviously started to show, you know, really where this can go based on a deflationary um, money supply, which was a term that I'd heard many years ago, but didn't really mean a lot to me or didn't have a lot of context. Yeah. Now I'm starting to understand it. I'm like, wow, this is powerful. So do you want to talk about how the, the trip came about? Because as I said, I was heading to Amsterdam for the second year in a row for the conference, this time as a as a oh, hosting an event, a satellite event, the Bitcoin Ballers Orange Cup tournament. Um, wasn't expecting Mr. Simpson, but I'm glad that you that you came because, as you said, going to the event, going to the conference and coming back, you you, you feel your rewards. And I always call it from the Bitcoin world, proof of work. So the fact that yeah. we went there, conversations we had have now materialized into other things. So there's something I need to reveal to you. I haven't told anyone yet, but um, yeah, you start with your your journey to to go into the conference and what made you change your mind or make, what made you make the decision, sorry, to attempt? What made me make the decision? You know, I, can't, I can't think back. Um, I, know, I know one of the big motivators were that you said to me, look, if you can get involved with onboarding organisations to these new Bitcoin payment systems, there is an incentive to, to get yourself a, a, a free pass for the event. I thought, well, that's got to be a fantastic thing. So as you know, um, I have a business in the e-commerce space. Um, and so the process of trying to onboard that organization was really positive. And the company- Do, I, that do, went, you, want to shield, do you want to shield the business? Feel free. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lingerie and bikini business for women with uh, small back measurements and large cups, which was never really been um, offered in the retail space. So it was a great opportunity to build an online presence where you could be much more specialized. Um, so yeah, uh, the company is called MissMandalay.com. So if, uh, if you're looking for a new bikini for your up and coming holiday or a new laundry set, um, for, for the coming months, then, uh, yeah, check out Miss Mandalay, fantastic designs, fantastic products and amazing fits. Um, but I would say that cause I'm slightly biased, but, <laughs> That, that's coming from the reviews that a lot of our clients and customers have told us about the quality of the product, but also the fit, which is really important for ladies who have that sort of shape. Let's hope we've got some lady listeners, some female listeners. Yes. <laughs> or even for the male listeners, if you're, if you're thinking about treating your wife and she's challenged with finding bikinis that fit, um, which surprisingly a lot of women do, um, then it's a great place to start finding fashionable uh products that have you know a fantastic fit just have a read of the reviews before you even enter the site to get a feel you know how clients are benefiting from the product but so yes it was that onboarding process and then and then the positive feedback from the organization that was promoting the incentive um and i forget the name of the company because unfortunately they, they couldn't onboard anybody that was is it uh, bitfinex bitfinex thank you yeah. and they couldn't onboard anybody that was non-euro denomination so with us being out of europe they couldn't actually offer it to uk e-commerce organizations because the uk is going backwards i'll just shake let's my not, head at that yeah. <laughs> i mean let's not even get to the us right i mean amazing yeah that's a whole a whole new chapter um but the bit for next guys were fantastic and i really I, I wanted to meet them and thank them at the event but didn't get a chance to meet up with them but so open, so supportive, and so kind. They still issued the uh, the pass for me, so that was a, a big yes. Let's go. You know, it's a four day trip to Amsterdam. Uh, as you know, I, I uh, with the recruitment business, I had an office for three years in Amsterdam, so I was used to doing that flight. It's probably easier to get to Amsterdam than it is to drive to Birmingham. Um, so yeah, it was it's worth a trip. Um, fantastic city. Forgot how amazing the people of Amsterdam and the Netherlands are. Uh, love the city. Great, great tip from you to, to hire bikes rather than going through Ubers. That made the whole three or four days even more fun. Managed to yeah. stay on the bike and dodge all yeah. the... Got, got fit, got fit yeah. and saved money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I'd advise anybody, um, mode of transport in Amsterdam, always a bike. Ten times better than Uber. 
or getting a tram, you can really explore the place and you, you feel a real sense of freedom straight away. So I, I love that part of the trip as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so that, that's how I got there. And I had zero expectations before going. I suppose my only driver was, as you know, I have a number of business ideas around the blockchain, but I, I don't, I have an understanding of technology, but I don't have a technical background. So one of my key objectives was to engage with developers within the space and get an understanding of how they work and and how I can engage with them with ideas that I may have for the future. And and again, over delivered on that expectation. Um, I'd like to say to all the listeners, and this is me not being in the sales mode, this is just a fact. I've been to many conferences over the years, um, many events like that. I've never experienced an event like this, where there's 6,000 people that have come together in a gathering that all have a total belief in the movement and their attitude towards everybody there is, how can I help you progress your story or your plan? Just the openness and, and the love, you know, it sounds a bit all soft, but it's like, no, this is the way the world should be. Mm -hmm. We're all in this together, trying to create this movement for a better, positive world. And just the temperament of, of every single individual you met, even some of the key speakers that were there, you know, you might have met them in a, in a meetup. They, they have this system where you go to the event and in the evening they'd hire a restaurant and then have a meetup where maybe 100, 150 people would turn up. And you could literally speak to anybody. There was no sort of class system that, you know, I'm a key speaker, so I can't speak to you. Or I'm a whale, I can't speak to you. Everybody was accessible and everybody wanted to have a conversation about something. So can't thank um, the Bitcoin magazine enough. And, and if you get chance, they did fantastic coverage of the event on YouTube. Just search up Bitcoin magazine and they caught everything on the main stage, which uh, did a fantastic professional job of doing it as well. Really fantastic show and conference. Definitely. And I'd just like to, to go back to a point you made about the people coming together and for the movement. So like similar to you, I've been, been to events before. Um, and the only time I've experienced something like the Bitcoin conference is when I went to my first Herbalife event and subsequent ones. And what I found different, the corporate ones I'd been to from my former life, you had to be there. Yeah. Nobody wanted to be, they had to be there. You, you're looking at a screen. It's not engaging the Herbalife event. Everyone wants to be there, but again, it's a company that you're working with or for the Bitcoin one is like, there's no company. No. We've all chosen to to come congregate around this core belief that everybody's both well, not everyone's most people are building something off of or n recognize something so the guy we met uh, lord snooty i won't dox his name he's not building anything on bitcoin but loves bitcoin and yeah. wants to be around bitcoiners so he yeah. traveled by a plane to get to the place ended up with an injury to the nose for for some reason but still there were so many other people like that and it's like yeah when you see something and feel it you can't um, you can't really explain it to people. No. There's, a, there's a meme that goes around, so I, and I say it to people, I can help educate, but I can't learn it for you. I no. can't feel it for you. You have to see it and feel it for yourself. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. And uh, my wife says I'm, I'm a raving madman at times. And we had a conversation the other day. So I put something in the group chat. She said, not everything revolves around Bitcoin. And I said, well, I'll, I'd argue it does. And we just I stopped like, there. I just stopped there. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. I mean, Something that changed in my life, um, I suppose, going back 20 years, I was a yes and no person. And when I built my business, even though it was hugely successful, there were many opportunities I missed out on because I wouldn't move from my position. And I was very much in the no zone. And I won't share them with you because there were massive opportunities. And I mean huge. Where I made the wrong decision. Going forward in life now, I've realized there is no yes or no. Whatever opportunity gets presented to you, you just have to try it with the least amount of investment to go through that learning process, to understand for yourself what it is you're being offered and whether it's a viable cause or not. And I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin comes under that realm. You don't have to dive in. You don't have to spend a lot of money, but don't stop from exploring it. One, to reinforce your thought process that yes, it is a no, or two, maybe to open up your mind and realize this is actually a fantastic opportunity. And I'd say that with everything in your life. Stop saying yes or no to things. Um, and that was probably inspired by uh, Jim Carrey's movie 
called the <laughs> yes. Man. Yes, man, yeah. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but he decided to say yes to everything and see without. I thought that was a fantastic sort of um, experiment and in a movie. That definitely works. Um, when I did the 75 Hard Challenge back in 2020 before I left construction, a site manager said to me, I just finished a walk and walked to site. He said, you're always smiling. Like, what's, what's, ha- why are you so happy? And I said, I, said, I started to say yes more. Yeah. And in, in the year before, in the year 2020s, my life train changed dramatically. Half marathon, cycled to Cologne, left left my work, took redundancy, started my, my, started my own business. No, I say, you say yes within reason. Of yeah, course. You're going to say yes to everything. But again, you make an informed decision. You look into something. Someone asks you, can you do this? Well, can I? Let's, let's have a look at it. It's not just a straight yes or no. No. No, get, get rid of that out of your life. I mean, that's what I did. Um, and while we're on the story of you, I just want to have a big shout out to Jay. So I met Jay when our sons were playing academy football back in probably about 2012, 13, 14, that sort of time period. Yeah, 14, 14. Yeah. 14 onwards. Yeah. Um, and we used to share a lot of conversations um, on the sideline. But it wasn't until both our sons were released from the academy. I've lost your sound, mate. Yeah, you're back. You're back now. We're kind of out of the regime of kind of UK Category 1 Academy football and we started to speak a lot more freely. I've watched this, which was probably about uh, 2019, 18, 19? 19, I think, yeah. And Josiah said to me at that point that, you know, I really want to get out of my job. You know, I'm, I've done well in, in construction. I've reached project management status, but I don't even know why I'm there. I don't even know the why. And from that point, and you mentioned already moving into herbal life and then going into Bitcoin based on our discussion and you watching Zeitgeist and then also hearing about Bitcoin at roughly the same time. This guy has evolved to such a level. When I went to Amsterdam, he he was almost on the f- verge of being famous. <laughs> <laughs> I said to my mom, I said, Ian kept guessing me up, <laughs> saying you're a celebrity out here. <laughs> there was one particular moment where I met this wonderful couple uh, from uh, the lady Charlene, who was from Washington. She was one of the, the speakers at the event, and her husband, Rind, um, who's Nigerian. Um, I, I kind of went over and introduced myself. Uh, we start talking about their um, organization called Mango Digital. She's an ex-investment banker. She has big ambitions to go to Nigeria, build one of the first Bitcoin mining plants there, and then looking to franchise that whole model across Africa. Fantastic story, fantastic vision. I thought, I'm thinking, wow, you're amazing. And then halfway through the conversation, Coach Carbon came up. And I said, yeah, that, that's my best friend. I, ca- I came with him to the event. She's like, oh, can, can I meet him? Can I meet him? I'd really like to meet him. I'm like, all right, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> well, this woman was like, 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 can I meet David Beckham or Michael Jackson type level? I'm like, yeah, sure, come with me. I'll introduce you to him. And they, they got together on the main stage and one of the events was just finishing. So then she proceeded to say, look, you know, I'd love to capture a, a little conversation with you, maybe do a mini, little mini podcast at the event and then we'll publish it. So, Jay, massive thanks to you, man, for sticking at it and, and evolving what you have. And, and, guys, if you can, get behind his Bitcoin baller movement because the crypto family love him for it. He's so yeah, Bitcoin, well connected. Bitcoin, Bitcoin family. Sorry, Bitcoin. Did I say crypto? <laughs> My yeah. apologies. I did that on purpose. No, I know, no. I know. <laughs> but the Bitcoin family is truly behind him and he's doing a fantastic thing with regards to educating the world. You know, it's not about making money, which you remember Edward Snowden made a huge point about that at the event. It's not mm. just about a line on a graph. It's much bigger than that. And Josias has really captured that value of, you know, let's start this journey. Let's build Bitcoin ballers and let's let's take it to the world and let's try and educate through a platform that's quite common to a lot of people already. You know, the, the sport of football. So I'm right behind him. Um, I experienced one of the first events in Holland, which I'm, I was really proud to be at and to experience that, to see you've, you've now lit the torch on an international level. And, and just keep going, Jay. Uh, brilliant transformation over the last four years. You've really gone for it. And what you've produced is truly phenomenal. So big shout out that. to Jay. Big shout out to his, uh, to his listeners. Get behind him. He's doing amazing things. And we can all, no matter how young or old you are, we can all kick a ball. So get involved. And help him on this journey. He's done some major things so far, including the link up with Oxford City um, and that whole sponsorship through that and trying to bring 
that knowledge to the masses. It does seem a bit crazy right now, but trust me, he's on the right journey. And whatever education you can glean from him at these events, he's trying to develop either you know through the children or young people are playing football or the families that are connected to it. Take some time out and, and take that yes or no out of your head and just go with them and research it. You, you might be surprised at the outcome. Thank you, mate. The, gra- the gratitude is reciprocated as well. So I mentioned about me going last year. This year was a different experience, a different experience because last year, obviously, I'd met people. And since then, I'd, I've met other people online. So it was kind of like a gathering of, of, of uh, friends. Yeah. But having someone else there, you the network effect of just two people. So the saying is when two or more agree on a common goal, nothing is impossible. Yeah. So you mentioned Charlene. I'm going to go back to just before the conference when you sent me two pictures. One was with Jimmy Song, and one was Charlene. He said, "You want to meet these people?" Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I laughed. I laughed when you sent when you showed me the picture of Jimmy Song. I went, "Well, if you would have listened to my podcast, Ian, yeah, you, you would have been you would have been halfway there." So I sent you the link to the podcast, and then when you sent me the Charlene yeah. Charlene's picture, I sent you a link to a conversation she'd recently had with Obi Nwusu, right? Who, for those who don't know, former owner of Coin Floor, who were then sold to Coin Corner, he now works with Feddy Mint. Yep, um, working on. Bitcoin projects for the Global South. Um, I think the project was funded by Jack Dorsey, formerly of Twitter. But anyway, yep. I sent you that, that link to watch, which was a good conversation. Um, but how the conversation came about with you introducing me to Charlene, if you weren't there, I possibly wouldn't have met Charlene. So the fact that you went off and had a conversation, heard my name, then brought her over to meet me. And then what happened after that, when we saw someone on their phone looking up the app and they were holding on my Bitcoin Borders page, Charlene then tapped him. We had another conversation that led to something else. Like, What's going on? Do you know what I mean? Network effect on overload. <laughs> and, and on that point, if if you're a new Bitcoiner, there were hundreds of people there just like that. Um, don't hold back from attending one of these events because you're a new Bitcoiner. They're fantastic for those sorts of people. Um, I stayed away from conferences because I felt I had to learn about it before I went there because I thought it would be you know, full of people that were well-educated and, and way above my sort of pay grade. Well, yeah, there are. There are loads of people way above your pay grade, but it's their attitude towards new Bitcoiners because they believe in the movement and they know by, you know, attracting or or, or convincing a new Bitcoiner um, that it's the way forward. It, it's another great milestone for the whole movement. And you remember the guy, as you just mentioned him from New Zealand, that was his first opening comment. And I met many people like that, that, you know, I'm quite new to this. This is my first Bitcoin conference. I'm just trying to work out what it is I can do to help the movement. And, and you said it on a number of occasions to a lot of people, you know, I'd identify your, your love in the real world and then try and integrate that into the Bitcoin community. I'm, I'm going to quote Aaron Dorr. Aaron Dorr, he's a hairdresser. Yeah, um, I'll put his details in the show notes, but he's the one that coined it on a podcast with Daniel Prince for Once Bitten. He said, when your passion and Bitcoins collide, amazing things happen. Exactly. And you and you saw it. You saw, you saw it firsthand. You've got artists, you've got designers, you've got sports people, athletes, um, podcasters, filmmakers, you name it. Somebody is doing something that they're passionate about, integrating Bitcoin in some way, some level, where it's education, where it's the finance, where it's the technology, where it's ed- uh, said, said education. Yeah, but then, yeah, anything you name that you're passionate about, bring it together with Bitcoin and yeah, amazing things will happen. Yeah, I can't. I mean, there's another trip coming up in Ghana. And as you know, <laughs> I, I, I broke into Stacey last night because <laughs> I hope she won't mind me saying So she um, is into spirituality. Um, they're going off topic, but I'll bring it back. Sure. And again, when I say the cat can't dismiss the internet, Russell Brand got it from him. He has a cat on his lap. The cat goes off, enjoys his day. When the cat comes back and Russell's on the laptop, the cat can't say the internet doesn't exist. The cat has no concept of the internet, but he can't dismiss it. So when she's into her spirituality and she says she feels stuff or senses stuff in her dreams, I can't say it's not true. Yes. I can listen and I can take my opinion on it, but she's been to two readers now. She went to one last night. This is the first one she's had in person. The one before she had on call. Mm. And I was there. I think I was there in the room listening. It was a bit eerie. she came come back last night. It was even eerier. And the guy mentioned about, yeah, you need to support what your husband's doing. Wow. It may, it, it may take a while, and there's a trip involved. And I went, I went last. I went, I said, don't tell Ian. She said, why? I said, because there's a trip in Ghana in December, and he wants me to go. <laughs> so I sowed the seed. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I, 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 I don't know. There's something about Africa. It's a natural resource. 
and Bitcoin. I think it's a perfect marriage. And and to have it in Ghana as well, another great location, another country I've always wanted to explore. Um, obviously, being from the Caribbean, the story goes that, you know, our forefathers may have come from the west coast of Africa, probably Ghana, which is well documented on the Bob Marley uh, movie. Um, there's a calling. So it's quite surprising that to find one of the next big conferences will be in, it will be in Ghana. And I think, would that be the first Bitcoin conference in Africa? Or they had no, no, they've had one before. But I think, because there's two, there's Adopting Bitcoin, which is a conference, which there's one in January in South Africa. And the African Bitcoin conference, I know there's been one, at least one before. I'm not sure which one it is hmm. out of the two. But it, it is like, they say you've taken the orange pill. Trust me, guys. <laughs> it is like a drug because you've never experienced anything like it before in your life. And like Josiah said earlier, there is no company in the middle that's promoting its new brand or its new product. It's just a group of people that believe in something for a better world. Hmm. Um, it's true. I'm, I'm going to bring in the levels again. Sorry. So when, again, you're from the corporate world myself. When I was at the conferences before, you looked around the room, everyone kind of looked the same. There might have been a few ethnic minorities. There might have been a few women. Got into Herbalife, people from all walks of life doing ages. Bitcoin is that again on steroids. Oh. People people from all different financial backgrounds as well. So different. What every single walk of life is involved in this movement. And even if you want to dismiss it, you have to ask yourself why. Right. Why are people spending so much time and energy talking, learning, educating about this thing? What is it? And if you look into it, I believe that you won't look back. And Sailor said it. I spout Sailor all the time. Nobody has done over 100 hours of learning on Bitcoin and dismissed it. I could totally so, agree with that. So people that are in the, on me, mainstream media or those in financial institutions that dismiss it, I say either are uneducated, haven't educated themselves, or are bad actors. Because yeah. I don't believe they, they fully understand it and are talking badly about it. If they're talking badly, there's, I think there's sinister reasons behind that. Yeah. Either pumping their bags or waiting for their investors to get in. Yeah. And I have friends and family members that I'll speak about the whole Bitcoin stroke crypto activity. And I've, you know, I haven't really got the time. I have one particular friend, very busy uh, in, in the corporate world, um, done fantastic, you know, moved through the promotions. And yet they are very busy. Um, unfortunately, two months ago, it got made redundant. So now the excuse is I haven't got any money to invest in it. And I, pull, and I pulled them up on it. I said, over the last 18 months, you've given me every excuse under the sun. I said, so let me give you an example in a simple term to motivate you. I said, our, our parents lived at a time when you could buy a house in London for 5,000, 10,000 pounds, right? How much would you have wanted to be alive at that particular time to invest in your property? But unfortunately, by the time we came into the property world, it had already 10 x probably even 20 x to maybe 100 to 150,000 pounds. Now you look at our children from that original five to 10,000, you know, it's probably what, um, 16 to 20 x from that time and now it's literally impossible to buy a property um, in London. But there was a time when everyone could just buy a property in London. And I can't help but- On, on, on a single wage in the household. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, where one person is working, that old, old fashioned model of husband and wife and that sort of stuff. And I, I look at Bitcoin and I, I can't help but make a connection to that. Bitcoin is at, at that period of where the housing market was in the 1950s the 1960s, where all the numbers worked and it was still at a realistic price. You roll on 10 years and we've been through another, what, two to three cycles. I think you'd be hugely shocked at what the value of Bitcoin is and the role it's now playing in the world. And if you just look at what's happening in the world today, if you really stop and watch and just don't assume these things are just happening, you know, um, the wards, uh, the the... The, the, the changes in, and I don't want to get into a whole political conversation, but the wars, the changes in sexuality, all these things are happening. They're not just happening because they're happening. There's a reason for it. Mm. There's a reason why that agenda is being pushed. So just open your eyes and ears to what's happening and, and, and try and recognize and understand what's going on. And then you'll start to maybe make the link to why Bitcoin 
and this movement could be the answer for a better world. Very well put. <laughs> but I think that's like, a, I'm people have got like that a disciple, aren't I? Yeah. Wow. The, the similarities are there between religion and you say about not getting political. Remember, there's a um, a video that the government did once about someone who doesn't talk politics. Him and his mate, and he went to the pub. He's yes. like, I don't talk politics. Yes. But everything, everything you mentioned, he said, you said you don't yes. talk politics. Yes. You can't talk about anything without discussing the money. And I don't just mean the price, but you're talking about financial incentives. So when you're told stuff by people, there is a reason why they're telling you something. And you have, there's a, the old saying, follow the money. Who are they being paid by? What, is, what are their incentives? And Bitcoin aligns your incentives. Other people, I would argue politicians are the main. Then you have people in the pharmaceutical industry. They have misaligned incentives. Um, but you can find aligned and misaligned incentives in every single walk of life. It was for you to, to find out what, what they are and to do your own research into it. Because there are, there are people in industries that we don't like that are good people. And our, one, for example, is the World Economic Forum and mm. the IMF. Mm. I heard a fantastic interview by a lady who's into Bitcoin now who used to work for the IMF. Mm. And she said she was just at the level where she could see the corruption and pulled herself away. She said, there's people below her that never got to see that. And so they think they're working for this great company that go into countries and give them money and help them. But the IMF are just gangsters. They're fraudsters. They're just stealing resources of countries and milk and cream on the top. You're like, wow, when you actually see it, you think, how can people within it not see it? But it's like anything, when COVID happened, um, it was me and Stacey laugh all the time because we went, we went along with it to a certain extent, but not too long. And then it was... It was something about the shops when you, oh and no, it was in, eating the out, bath. where you, when we were sat at the table and you stand up, you have to put the mask on. Yeah. And we, if someone brought up the other day, we looked at each other and went, what idiots. Right. What idiots. Right. <laughs> but everyone was in it. Everyone yeah. was in that bubble. Well, I think it shows the power of the pipe, which I'm, when I say the pipe, I mean the media pipe, right? Hmm. That's why they're called programs, right? Exactly. they're programming, Right. But just step back and, and everyone's got it. Just use your common sense. And, and in a normal world, would you accept this? And it's a brave thing to do. I get it. And, and, and you're literally going to shatter all your beliefs that you've been brought up on when you're going on this journey. But it's okay. Because the outcome is, 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 I believe, going to be really positive. Um, it's, it's scary at times. It, it is lonely. Um, so even to that extent, so Stacey and I went for the same experience I, th I was fortunate enough, again, foot in different camps. I was in construction, but also playing football. So nothing made sense to me. And that made me question things. And then when I had the free time leaving work, nothing made sense even more. Yeah. But Stacey, Stacey was still kind of, started still kind of in that world. Um, but because I have more time, I have more time to, to look, discuss, um, digest. But it is having, taking that time to then come out, we call it coming out of the matrix, taking the orange pill. You then see things differently. But yeah, it's, it's lonely to start with. But I would say just just do it because the and the again, more, the more people we can, the more people we can free from the system, the, the stronger the network has become. Yeah, no, I exactly. understand network network effects, but you're helping people. And if this yeah. podcast reaches just one person that makes them think, I'm going to think about something differently, then it's job done. Because initially, it, it's the it's so easy to pump the price. I mean, like like you said earlier on in the in the podcast in the opening statement. You know, we hope to do this before, so it feels a bit like we're riding the wave. But I suppose everyone had an expectation that this was going to pump and we're coming to the halving period. So that that is a way to attract people into this, you know, into this community. But but don't just stop at the price of a, 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 a of an asset. There's like, there's a there's a saying for everything in the Bitcoin space. It's called came for number go up, stay for the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's so true because the, 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 the pump will attract you and to let everybody know and I haven't got a crystal ball it's just understanding Bitcoin again we are about to go through a halving process if you'd like to Google that and understand that, what, what that is again there's loads of information out there about it and that has generally been seen as a start of the next pump so we had one in COVID between 20 and 21 which lasted about 18 months maybe a bit less come probably March, April this year we'll start another pump, which will hopefully lead us out into the end of summer, September, October 2025. And we will see a massive bull run. And I don't think I'm talking out of line saying this. I think it's quite clear to anybody who's adopted this new regime that we can clearly see. We don't know how much it's going to pump, 
and every cycle is different based on things that are happening in the world. But the way the sort of fiat and old world is is operating at the moment and the turmoil that's happening and then the potential investment of the big institutions and the big investors in the world that are most successful, like Warren Buffett, Larry Fink, and so on and so forth, there is a sense that this will be quite a bull run now because I think it's going to be that first stage of adoption when we go from millions of people in the movement to hitting the billions of people in the movement. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what, what will come out of that and uh, what gains we can all make from that. But it does take time to understand it. So there's no better time to start than right now, really. Uh, 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 the last bull run, I was about a year and a half to two years into my education, and I was guessing. And I did get wrecked on a number of coins. Okay, I didn't lose a load because I was testing. But two years on from that now, the information I've gained, the knowledge I have, when I'm now listening to maybe some of these influencers or talking to people in, in the environment, it makes so much more sense now. I have so much more clarity. I'm, I'm feeling so much more confident about the positions I'm taking up within the space and, and hopefully what, what that can bring as far as, you know, building generational wealth for the future. But like I said, it's not just about money. You've got to get to these shows and realize what's going on. There's so many underlying benefits to this movement. And I wanted to ask you a question on this. I don't know the answer. Once the last Bitcoin is mined, you're going to have all these rigs out there offering all this power to the network. You know, what will they do to sustain their business when the last Bitcoin is sort of mined? Yeah. So that, again, non-technical, this is just from my knowledge and understanding, people argue that miners will still be incentivized to secure the network for the rewards on transactions. Right. So... They still, they will still earn the transaction fees, and obviously, what Bitcoin prices in fiat terms, if we still think that way, that reward, even if it's just in Sats, will be enough to sustain them. If it's they like are, a, it's like a mega node, then, right? Yes, right. Yeah, you just yeah. go a big node. So yeah, secure, secure, secure on the network. Um, so yeah, no block reward, but you are receiving the transaction fees. So now you're getting that annuity revenue as more people adopt onto the blockchain. Yeah. You own a, a number or a size of rig. That has so much capacity, you're taking on so many transactions on a daily, weekly basis, and for that you're being incentivized. But that that's layer one, right? Mm. So we're talking about layer two, which are lightning. Layers may be a bit off that. We may get to a stage where there aren't real any transactions on layer one. That Bitcoin layer is just gonna be transacted in your if we talk about fiat terms now, in your multi million billions of pounds. Everyone else will be transacting on layers above. Yeah. So yeah. If you understand money, you'll understand, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say by that, but Bitcoin base layer has now been built off of on, and now I would say a lot of people are beginning to understand the power of lightning. Um, God, I remember oh, that's what I wanted to ask someone to say to you. So on that note, lightning, we experienced it. You Would you say it's kind of for the first time properly in Amsterdam? I know we've discussed it before and I've shown you worked examples, but you, yeah, where I did you go? I can't, I mean, there, there was, there was a bar in the middle of the event, which when they had a breakout session, people would go along, get themselves a refreshment or whatever. And I was, it was about four or five deep at the bar, right? People went to be served. And I must have seen it happen about 20 times. And it, it just totally shook me that it, it progressed so much. So what I'm talking about, the, the barman or the bar lady would serve up the drinks. And the next comment was, would you like to pay with credit or with Bitcoin or with a debit card? And I'd say 50, it was 50-50. And when I saw the Bitcoin process of paying something happening for myself in real life, and why I didn't video it, I don't know. It was so fast and so easy and so quick. And this was happening all the time across the conference. Even the breakout sessions when we went to the restaurants in the evening, you again had a choice. Do I pay with my debit credit card or do I pay with Bitcoin? And yeah, that was a game changer for me. That, that showed the real potential because we all know Bitcoin has had an issue about, you know, it's slow, um, you know, does it have the capacity? But then the Lightning Network was built on top of the blockchain 
and, and already you can start to see them making you know, major milestones. You know, making yeah. that speed. I mean, the speed. We think that the, the credit and debit card is quick. So when you go to the um, the supermarket, or whatever, or to the corner shop, and you do your contactless, that probably takes maybe a second, second and a half to complete. Right? This was instant. And to the instant. instant and final settlement, there's no six, fifty to sixty day wait. No. Yeah. It was, and so imagine this on a global scale now, when you want to transfer funds or whatever for, for anything. Yeah. On, on so network. I want to blow your mind some more now because I've, I've been a big, um, is it proponent? Yeah. You support something of of lightning, and so a lot of what I do is built on top of that. And I mentioned to you many times my podcast is on Fountain, which is on the Lightning Network. Yeah. So this actual episode. If you do it in time, you create an account on Fountain. Yeah, I'm gonna do a split um, on the account. So people that are listening, when they listen via Fountain, they receive sats to listen. So it's there. I'm incentivized, or we're incentivized to make good content, so they keep listening. Fountain will reward them with sats continuously more they listen. But equally, then, if someone gets value from this conversation, they can tip, they can send a boost, they can boost sats to us. And what will happen if we split? the um the episode and you have an account the sats go directly to your account so you as a content me as a content creator you as a guest yeah see we can receive money we can split that however we like 80 20 50 50 but you don't even have to really understand what bitcoin is you just know you've been on the episode you've received some value the next thing i wanted to talk about was the video that i posted um as a wrap-up for the, the the tournament in amsterdam yeah. So it's, it's on Instagram now. It's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. We met um, Ben Ark, yep. uh, who created who created Alan Bits as a way to integrate Lightning into everything, different faucets. So you got juice boxes. He's amazing, by the way, he's, he's so intelligent. You go. He's from he's from Wales. I've seen him travel all around the world, helping people on board on Lightning from El Salvador, UK. He helped me build my first um, point of sale device. But yeah, that, off on a tangent. Within that video, so if you go and watch that video, there's a QR code where you can get some free sets. Brilliant. So as you're watching the video on YouTube, you can get your phone out and scan it, and you can receive some free sets that I have hosted somewhere. And I don't know who, who that person could be who scans it. You could be anywhere in the world watching that video, and you can scan some free sets. But what you must be able to do, or what's do, is one, watch the video, know when to see it, and it, is, it does pop up. It says free sets, and scan it in time. And there's also a time lock, so you can't just watch it and keep scanning. There's a time, I won't say what a time lock is, but yeah, you can't do it continuously. But I can top up that wallet anywhere in the world, whenever I want. So I could, that video is there now in the ether. One day I could say, I'll stick a Bitcoin on there. Yeah. I'm not going to, but yeah. then somebody uh, randomly in five, 10 years time, I'll watch that video. I'll scan that. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever technology or currency could you do that with? It's, it's incredible. Like, it's, like, it's, like, <laughs> it's like music. It's like music royalties on steroids, right? Yeah, yeah. So if if you're into producing content, I mean, obviously, part of this process is that you got to onboard yourself into Bitcoin and have a Bitcoin wallet, and obviously, then start collecting stats and and then giving out stats for whatever you want to buy. So again, to the listeners, just just remember that yes or no thing. Just go on the journey. Don't, I'm talking about maybe committing a ten pound something mm -hmm. you waste in a pub or in a restaurant or a night out of the cinema. I'm not talking about you know your life savings or like something to sell your house and buy a bitcoin. It's not you'd have to take that level of risk, but just try it. And if there's any problems, I'm sure Jay would be more than happy to reach out and help DM him or whatever. Um, but do you know I said there's like no excuses. Everything's out there. You just have to find it. Yeah. So I, I played the video on YouTube and I asked Jaden to scan it and he went to get his phone camera out, normal camera. I said, no, it needs to be a wallet. And he went, no, I tried it. So he got his camera out. It takes you to the Alan Bits website, which tells you t how to download a wallet. Like it's you couldn't make it any more simple. He's unbelievable. <laughs> that guy's unbelievable. I did get a chance to speak to him on the last breakout on the Friday evening. Oh, you what went cooking, that? mate. The people that you were telling me that you spoke to were like, <laughs> I think I was gobsmacked. You spoke about, to some celebrity. What about, ex, what about the ex ice hockey player that is about the, film, to, the filmmaker? He's yeah. literally about to sell a really good good movie documentary called Dirty Coin about the whole Bitcoin mining space, and he, he kind of alluded to the fact that it could be on Amazon or on Netflix. So 
wished him all the best with that and said, you know, looking forward to, to catching up with that. So if, if you are listening, check out um, dirtycoin.com, I think, right? www.dirtycoin.com yeah. has got a fantastic website. You can watch the trailer. Uh, it's just a whole documentary on the, the birth of Bitcoin mining and, and obviously what it means. So it's another piece of information to gather. And you met the creator of Damas. I was, I was, oh yeah, I was impressed with that. Yeah, so so <laughs> I, so, uh, so the going back to the point of me wanting to meet developers, they were on tap. I mean, I mean, I met so many amazing developers who. And one thing I always struggle with developers is that they're so immersed in technology, it's very hard to have a conversation with them about what they're doing, and then them putting it into layman terms, so you really understand mm. the impact of the application they're building, whatever. Quite the opposite of this event. Um, we met we met the guy at the first in the arcade we went to remember that first break yeah. went the first evening this this guy uh, roomed with the founder of Snapchat um, Spiegel Ben Spiegel was it spent four years at Stanford University uh, studying computer science with him and now Ben Spiegel his friend launched Snapchat and is is obviously a multi billionaire for that success um, the guy you mentioned I was having a general chat with him about you know, Bitcoin and the world at large, only then to find out that someone tapped on my shoulder and said, you know, that is, I was like, no. He said, oh, it's the guy who invented Damas and, and Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey funded him all the way. I'm like, why did someone tell me that when I was in the conversation? <laughs> so that that's another example of just how open the movement is. I mean, you'd probably watch these people on YouTube being interviewed and think, wow, amazing guy. Probably never get a chance to meet him. And they're all just an arm's length away. Mm. And what, what was also flipped on the head is when we spoke to Lord Snooty, is people have a perception of crypto bros, that sort of thing, where's a Lambo, what they look like. He said, you want to look for the person with the scruffiest jeans, the dirtiest trainers, that's the Bitcoin billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> that's who's going to find your project. It's so true. No, nobody, nobody goes there to flex and show wealth. And it's, it's flipping society on its head when we talk about low time preference and um delayed gratification and that's what i try and promote with with, with the bitcoin border stuff it's like no we need to we've lived now in a fiat mindset where we want everything now it's got to be done right now we want it and we'll take credit for it no 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 put things in the distance what am i what work am i going to put in to earn that or to get there first and it may take a year four years ten years but i'm going to take my time and there's a process to go through and yeah so crypto bro is there a thing of the past yeah, never, never got involved in that. You, you're looking for the scruffiest person in the room who has, probably hasn't got a car. And if they've got a car, it's, it's 10 years old. <laughs> and it's so true, though, because I was listening to Jeremy Rifkin again on the third. And these, these sort of movies, documentaries you can watch, it's always good to go back and watch them again maybe a year later when you've progressed your education. And it's amazing how many more you think, oh, my God, how come I didn't hear this the first time around? And you mm. pick up more sort of sound bites and alpha to help you on your journey. And um, I literally did that yesterday. I watched it again. And he was talking about the transition from geopolitical to, to, to biosphere. And he said that the, the next generation coming through, are, and they call it biosphere consciousness, forget about the material things, the fast cars, the bling, the jewelry. You know, it, it's all about you know, protecting our planet for the future. And protecting- Careful, though. Do you know what you sound like? You sound like a WEF agent. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. <laughs> Apart from Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Said, exactly. You'll own so, Bitcoin and you'll be happy. Yeah. And, yeah. and, so and at, some, at some stage, we need to go into the mechanics of mm. how we perceive from our knowledge how Bitcoin will work in this new world and how, as a store of value, it can give you the opportunity to, to, to live a great life and do positive things that, that are good for your your village, your, your your town, your community, your country, your continent, the world. Um, right, I, I really, totally agree with you. Worldly possessions will have less of. Yeah, um, we're, yeah. We're, we're being more nomadic, I believe, as a society, freely, hopefully freely moving, or go where you're treated best, shall I say, because there'll be some jurisdictions that you won't want to be in. Um, sure. It's all, about, it's all about game theory at the moment. So uh, the Argent, Argentina just had a presidential elections. The guy who was running one of the guys was running so i can't remember his name he he's a pro bitcoiner unfortunately didn't get the votes he needed mm. to contest um but still it was out in the mainstream 
people in Argentina probably experienced the worst inflation around the world. Oh. The, f- the fact that he didn't take this opportunity is like, like something missed, but people have seen what happened, what's happening in El Salvador. Their GDP has gone up, their crime rate's gone down. You could, people argue that he's a, that Nayib Bukele is a dictator, but 90% of people rating, you have the opposition parties spreading positive media about him. It's like, if all that's happening, that's happening for a reason. And obviously they've taken Bitcoin as a, as a, as a standard for their currency. Mm-hmm. There's more that has built off of that. So by just by doing that, it's attracted more business, um, more investment. You would argue people would look at that and think, actually, how is that going to help my country? And having someone run for presidential election with Bitcoin as part of their campaign is like, wow, it's, ta- it's, it's going somewhere within 14 years. And now you have all the major institutions ETFs coming on board, lining up, queuing up to be approved by the SEC. Yep. How long can they hold that, that gate back for? It's almost like saying now, um, Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi have said, right, football now, and you're going to argue with two of the best footballers in the world. That's actually a rubbish analogy, but we'll go Yeah, with it, it is, it is, it is. So, <laughs> so you've, got, you've got people like Warren Buffett and Larry Fink, that uh, JP Morgan, all these big financial institutions... You know, going back 18 months, told you Bitcoin's volatile, it's a scam. You know, there's, there's loads of rug pulls. Don't invest in it, you can lose all your money. And now a year, year and a half later, they're putting 1% to 2% of their funds, which are, and their funds are massive. And when I say 1%, 2%, we're talking about three to $500 million of their funds, maybe growing to a billion dollars being moved and that you've got to remember that the, the value or the amount of money in Bitcoin at the moment is about half a billion. That's a massive shift um, for the positive. So if the best uh, investors in the world are now committing one, two percent of their large funds under management into Bitcoin, that has to send a message to you to say, hold on a minute. If Messi and Ronaldo are doing it, then maybe I should be thinking about it. Mm. And it's crazy when you talk about that, that allocation, how the fiat world works. I'll explain it to a friend of mine um, recently. You sent the 1%, 1% to 2% allocation. That is purely because to do with the amount they are allowed to invest. So someone like Michael Saylor with MicroStrategy, he's gone all in. So MicroStrategy on a Bitcoin standard. They are, the, I think, the best performing company in the last few years. Yeah. Um, their portfolio has smashed everything. Th- that's just by taking on Bitcoin 100%. Or 100%. And taking on credit to do so, which if you're going to do that, be careful. But Sailor's got his game plan. Yeah, companies that take on a small allocation, say one two percent, they probably want to do more. But when their certain lunch. asset reaches a certain amount, they then have to sell it to to to, to level it out. I was like, but that doesn't make sense. If you know yeah. something's decent and good, why would you not have say fifty one percent more of it? But, but it's... <laughs> the, the re- unfortunately, the regulators have to prop up the old market. It can't yeah. just be a and this is what I mean, it can't just be a complete shift in 24 hours. It's got to be a, 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 a gradual process to that point. Yeah. I suppose it's a bit like the, the birth of the internet, right? You know, we didn't get Facebook till probably, what, 05, YouTube around that same time. I first used the internet in probably 1994. So the real birth of the internet didn't come along until those social media, YouTube, where we real, really started to see use cases for the internet. And, and how we could create content and information. And that was a good 10, 10 to 15 years before we saw that. Um, and, and they say that, you know, Bitcoin and crypto is going to be the same. And I, I totally agree. It, it's, it's, it's an evolution, isn't it? It's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. But don't, don't get caught sleeping on it. Because I go back to the, the housing market as an example, just to bring it back into real world. Um, yeah, real world understanding. that. If you could have bought a house in London for 5000 back in 1950, 1960, I'm sure you'd have taken up the opportunity you know, you know now. Mm. Um, I think Bitcoin and the blockchain offer a much, much larger opportunity, not, not just in the financial gain and the generational wealth that you can create for yourself and your loved ones, but also for the way the world will run in the future, which to me sounds a lot better than the inflationary world that we've lived in of fiat for the last, what, 80 years of, of the empire. I'm, I'm just so looking forward to this. And for, for those who are questioning it, for the first time in history, we have, we have an asset that a millionaire and, a, oh, here we go, a millionaire 
and someone homeless living on the street can get the same rewards per their investment. So yeah. there was a guy, there's a guy in Reading, homeless guy. Oh, what's his name? His name's not Eaton, is it? <laughs> no, no. I put it in the show notes, but somebody onboarded him with a, he has a phone, so I onboarded him with a wallet, but he makes little um, metal figures. Yeah. So he sells them and receives Bitcoin. So someone put on Twitter put his QR code on a picture of his phone with a QR code. What did I do? Save the picture, put the picture in my reader and send me some sats. It wasn't a lot, but he'd received value from me. He doesn't know who I am, but Sailor is stacking sats by the thousand loads of Bitcoin. This guy is stacking sats by per sat. But when Bitcoin goes up because of adoption, Sailor's going to get a percentage increase. This guy on living on the street making metal models is going to receive the same. No other asset has been able to do that. And you mentioned about buying property. Yes, when prices were five, ten thousand pounds at that time, that was a lot of money for some people. Some people Definitely. were fortunate or, or saw the foresight. But imagine then being able to buy a brick, so a portion of that house that is now two hundred x. You can do that with Bitcoin. You haven't got to own a whole Bitcoin. You can yeah. own a percentage, tiny percentage. But yeah. as the value grows, so will the, the the amount that you hold, the value of that will grow. Um, so e- opportunity is equal opportunity, and those who see it and understand it. Are going to benefit the most early adopters benefit the most and again it's billionaires and the man on the street have the same opportunity all you need to do is just look into it and understand it a tiny bit and understanding it could just be okay someone said to download this wallet i'm going to download it and i'm going to receive some sets and you might not ever touch that wallet again until 10 years time and then you look at it and your friend your friend reminds you you realize bitcoin's a million dollars or million pound of it or sugar but by having by being open by not just say no you've opened yourself up to opportunity. I mean, this, this, there's certain things that have been happening in the world that will that is definitely showing us the change is taking place. And I'll, I'll cite them now. And I, I'm hoping on this podcast, whoever's listening, you're stopping and starting it because I'm hoping there's enough alpha here. You know, we're not, we're not really benefiting from this. We just have a real belief in this movement and realise that it, it could or will produce a better world going forward on every level, not just finance, but everything. And yeah, for, for example, like, you know, does everyone really know that on the 31st of December, Bitcoin was valued at just over $15,000, right? And within four months of the 15th of December, it had grown to $30,000 in value. Um, yet, where in the world was that documented that Bitcoin has just, you know, grown by 100%? Yeah, the any month. narrative you'll hear, oh, it was 69,000, now it's 15. Right. Yeah. yeah. So again, find the time. Stop saying yes or no. Right? Explore it. It's it's going to be an amazing journey. Whoever goes on it, and, and once you do get to that point of taking the pill, you'll thank yourself um, a million times. And and I'd just like to say, we don't benefit from this, right? We're, we've we've taken ourselves on that journey. Unless and, unless you want to, you want to throw some sats our way, boost the episode. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will store them safely for the next. Two, three cycles. <laughs> yeah. But but if you don't, that's okay also. Because just to know that we've maybe captured the hearts of another two or three, four, five people who want to go on this journey. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my um, laptop now and, and we're getting close to $35,000 for one Bitcoin. Yeah, on the 31st of December, it was $15,000. And if you turn on those media pipes of the mainstream in this fiat world, Nowhere will they document that, you know, we're now at, what, 130% of what it was in December. I mean, you know, anybody's interested in, in, in creating generational wealth and investing um, their hard-earned money. Their hard-earned what, time and yeah, energy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what better opportunity? And it, and it will go up and down. It's not going to be a straight line to the top. But, you know, Joe will be the first to tell you it, it's, a, it's a long-term investment. You know, it's, a, it's a volatile appreciating asset rather than the pound in your pocket, was a, which is a stable depreciating asset. And think, and this is one of the motivates for me now. You're not late to the party, even though it was fifteen thousand dollars in December at the end of the year, and it's down almost thirty five thousand. Don't sit there and think, "Oh, I missed out on that growth." That no, no, this is a long term play, right? And if you're buying now, this could be the last time in the history. That Bitcoin will ever be around thirty, thirty-five thousand. So you're never going to get. It. You should be thinking, I'm never going to get it this cheap. Mm. Even with the next bull run that will take place, 
and then the the bear market after that will it ever really go back to sort of you know sub thirty thousand? Mm. Was well, Stephen Levera, um, who's a Bitcoin educator, was on the show recently? I just only saw a clip, and he forecasted again. I'm not no price prediction for me, but someone in the, who's been in the space a long time, five hundred k at the top, dropping down to eighty k at the at the bottom. Now it may go past that, or may go above it. Who knows? But that's from someone who's done a lot of analytical um, research and re- re- research on it. And he could be wrong. Who knows? But yeah. well, we all could be wrong. But big Bitcoin is based based on software on software on maths on equations. If you look at previous cycles, just by looking at the patterns, the patterns repeat. Obviously, price is different, and the dates may vary slightly by a few months. But the pattern is there to see. Yeah. Now, Sailor argues that all your models are broken. Going forward, that model could be smashed. Who knows? But three cycles before have shown something. We're in the middle of one now, and it's showing us exactly the same. Right now, who am I to say that's going to be wrong? All I can do is is proceed on my understanding and my knowledge. Yeah, and and we're not trying to be you know crystal ball predictors and say right it's going to go to this. We just know that what the blockchain and Bitcoin stand for is the answer for all the problems that we have in the world today. And they all start with debt and inflation. So if Bitcoin can overcome those two things, that's got to be something positive in the world, surely. Mm. Which leads us to, I know we're we're going well for time, just over an hour, but I want to speak about Jeff Booth because you you directed me to a conversation. Um, So Jeff Booth versus George Gavin on what Bitcoin did with Peter McCormack. Um, those who've listened before know I have a slight connection with Peter McCormack, the fact that I trialed for his Rail Bedford team. But um, he's a well-known podcaster in the Bitcoin space. I think mean, he's got the number one Bitcoin podcast. But Ian directed me to a conversation with Jeff Booth, who wrote, what's his book called? It's a, oh, I forgot the name. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's about deflationary technology. Yeah. Um, how technology should make things cheaper over time. And we live in a world where it's not a true free, a true free market. Yep. So companies and organizations are propped up by inflation, basically, by money printing. Um, so he argues things should get cheaper. But George Gammon is, is funny because someone I used to follow and watch his shows in 2020 on YouTube. And it got to a point where I, th- I understood, I realized he didn't understand Bitcoin. So I stopped yeah. listening to him. Yeah. And then by listening to the conversation, I understand we spoke about incentives earlier on in the call. He has misaligned incentives or the fact that he has a fiat mindset. So he's also, also always thinking in fiat terms. Where Jeff, Jeff Booth is totally out of that and thinking on Bitcoin terms, and that you you could see where they came to loggerheads. I believe Jeff was speaking truth because you could tell in George's tone of voice that he was a bit confused. And me being a Bitcoin maxi, people could argue, yeah, but you're going to side with Jeff time after time. But as Daniel Prince once said to me, we live in an echo chamber in Bitcoin space, but in the Bitcoin space, the echoes make sense. <laughs> and I couldn't agree more. And what what captivate, captivates me on that debate was the way Jeff just kept calm mm. the whole way through it. And it was almost like he was just chipping away at the block. Yeah. You yeah. could see it happening. Yeah, but, you can yeah, see, you can see Jeff, 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 Jeff um, George Gammon said, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but what if, yeah, but what if, and Jeff, yes, when that happens, this will happen. And when that happens, what you don't understand, George, is... Yeah. <laughs> It, it was like a game of chess, and you could uh, see you could see twenty moves ahead. And I'm like, uh, what was the other guy? Called? I haven't got his name. George, George Gammon, which he, yeah, he's very George intelligent Gammon. on the macro stuff. He yeah. knows his stuff. No, he does. He does, but it may be too intelligent. So mm. if you've been really successful in the previous market, it, as far as you're concerned, it's not broke. So why fix it? Where maybe yeah. other people are, are, are looking. I mean, Jeff said and, that he's offloaded a lot of his investments and he yeah. spent the last two years touring the world, probably trying to find that place in the world that he can settle with his, uh, with his wife and kids. Um, but yeah, fan- fantastic job um, done by him. Absolutely amazing style of debating that you could see like 15 minutes, 20 minutes in his conversation that, that he was going to get his point across. And I think ultimately, um, you know, win the debate. And he didn't once raise his voice or, or anything like that. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But what he was saying, in, in my typical style, after he'd finished the conversation, I went straight to the internet, took some of the captions that he said, put them back in, 
and found some amazing article articles out there that just really reinforced and, and, and got me to a point where whatever my predictions were for Bitcoin for the future have been totally blown out of the water. Mm. And that comment you always make when we're discussing sort of price predictions, why are you being so bearish here? <laughs> I've got to give you that one. You know, I mean, you flipped it on me, didn't you? Yesterday when I spoke about bread being ten pound in the future, yeah, <laughs> and you that means Bitcoin's ten million. Why are you so bearish? <laughs> <laughs> but what I love about these these conversations, not just the Bitcoin ones, but the ones I've had, is a snapshot in time. So if someone listens back to the one we had in January twenty two or December twenty one, yeah. there'll be things that I would have said that I probably changed my mind on. But yeah. at that moment in point, a moment in time my point was valid to me because that's how I understood and, under and experienced something. Whereas now it's different or maybe different in the future. We do another episode. We may be on a different level of understanding the stuff, but this moment in time, these, these are our thoughts. These are our understandings. Now people can listen and learn from that and go away. Like you do take screen grabs to, to uh, notes from the conversation, go off and, and explore. Where does that take you? Where's that thread going to lead to? I mean, what a journey, right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like this, this becomes yeah. part of your life, and it's like every day is a little bit, a little success yeah. here, a little success there. It's just it's such a buzz. Maybe, what maybe I, I'm a, an absolute geek or whatever. I don't know. No, maybe. we are. We, we are geeks. But what I loved being with you in Amsterdam is that in 2017 we went away with the kids um, for a football Denmark. tour in Denmark, Denmark Esberg, yeah, yeah. Esberg. Yeah, and the whole trip was different. Obviously, we were watching football, but the conversation we were having then are totally different to what we're having now. We're talking about macro, microeconomics. We're talking about technology. We're talking about politics. <laughs> we weren't talking about that before. <laughs> if I remember, didn't you capture uh, a video of, of us in the club reliving our youth? Yeah, yeah. Mixing what song was it? What there was a, I can't remember what song it was, but yeah, we were out raving, which we still do now. But yeah. we 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 learn whilst we're away. Yes, <laughs> we educate ourselves. We network. Yeah. Well, it gives us purpose. I mean, you know, there's nothing better than being able to go to a, maybe a country they haven't visited too often. You've got reason for being there. You've got a whole family when you touch down just made the whole experience so different mm. and so much more positive. I mean, I, I, and I'd love to do the same experience in Ghana. I've never, you know, I went to Kenya for a friend's birthday at the, at the uh, early part of this year. And that was an amazing experience to, to be in East Africa. We really want to do West Africa. You know, what a great excuse to explore West Africa whilst doing a Bitcoin conference and making more connections. Um, and, and honestly, my inbox is full of new connections that are and they're really purposeful connections and meaningful connections. It wasn't just meeting someone for the first time. The conversations are starting. We're sharing information with each other. It's gone as far as now the developer guys that we met, I was suggesting them we with, with the bull run coming and obviously the need to research, you know, what narratives will drive the bull run going forward. We, we shared a WhatsApp last night saying, let's create a group. Let's, let's, get together on a weekly basis on a on a video call somewhere. Let's form some sort of plan and let's just start researching this space together to identify, you know, those potential projects that, that could do well going forward, whether that be on the Lightning Network or on sorry I'm gonna swear now. On the Ethereum, on the Ethereum network. Oh no, no. <laughs> Sorry have you, have you seen the price of Ethereum to Bitcoin yeah. recently? Yeah. yeah. I I wouldn't buy that shit coin. <laughs> I don't want to build off it either. You don't have to. <laughs> but I suppose the, ba the base of our discussion is, and I, I understand where Jesus is coming from, he's a pure Bitcoin maximalist. And, and as an educator, it'd be wrong with him mm. to find himself within another network. Which um, I think when, when you understood that, not that it was as a relief, and it wasn't, the, I wasn't not patronizing at all to say, oh, I'm so thankful that you see it. It was like a relief that you could see where I was coming from and that I wasn't, I know I'm not a madman, but when I've come across as a purist, you understood why. And when, it's when we left the Edward Snowden talk and you looked at me, yeah, I get it now. I get it. Mm. You still need to dip your toe into some of these <laughs> new projects, though. I'll let you do that. You can just tell me. All right. That's, no, but see, this is it. This is working together, guys. So this is what it's about, right? It's a vast market space. And it's not just about, you know, Bitcoin and crypto. There's loads of, you know, you've got AI. You've got... I think I sent it to you yesterday. Elon Musk has just invested in a new housing project where now they want to take housing into a manufacturing plant. And there's a company in California that's literally doing that right now. It's produced the first 500 houses. And when you look at what they're doing, it's going to create affordable housing in the future. 
and and this could be the answer um, for leveling off of of housing, where we're not in an inflationary market, and and properties are being sold from a manufacturing line at the cost of manufacturing, mm. plus maybe a ten to twenty percent margin, so the company can make a profit and build and establish their organisation. So that there's so much going on, you could probably have a team of twenty people that meet once a week that could feed back into the centre, and 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 watch. I've said it already, watch the third industrial revolution with Jeremy Rifkin. He does a very good job of identifying the five pillars mm. of this new new revolution that we're moving into from the current industrial one. And there's a lot. Yeah, you you discussing the housing about taking it down to its manufacturer's cost. Jeff book Jeff Bruce book, The Price of Tomorrow, discussed that. This discusses that. So yeah. Yeah. If you want to go and check that book out, it talks about living in a deflationary economy. Um Let's wrap up now because we've been nearly an hour and a half. Um, well, that was fantastic, Jay. It's, it's, it really feels as though we've, yeah. we've really progressed with both our learnings and that the Amsterdam event was a, was yeah. the initial crescendo, but there's another, you know, we've reached level one of the peak. We've got to keep going now, right? I'm just going to say to you, don't forget me, Ian. I can see you're going to go clear. They're telling me about these the secret I... meetings you're having. What's that, groups? I'm not involved in that group. <laughs> uh, well, I said to the guy... <laughs> You know the guys from uh, Cali that we met, yeah, yeah, yeah. who knew everyone in the um, in the uh, Bitcoin and crypto space. Who, were, who was anybody, including yeah. uh, Vital and and Michael Saylor? Yeah. Um, I said to him, look, I, I, I really would like to invite Jay along, but he's so anti crypto. I think it, <laughs> I think he'd vomit at the thought of joining us. But if <laughs> if you're feeling a bit of FOMO, uh, no, no, this no, is no, my no, chance, no. guys. This is my no. chance. <laughs> If you're feeling a bit of FOMO, the invitation is always there. It would be a pleasure to have I, you. I, I appreciate the invitation, um, but I don't think I, I can accept. I, I'll, I'll let you feed back the, uh, from the conversation. But what's something, I'm not going to reveal it because nothing's happened yet. But from our visit to Amsterdam, um, I spoke about it, just happened to pass by the Calabria store, spoke with people there. They've now reached out to me and have, want to do a collaboration. Awesome. Well, when it came through, like I didn't, I didn't push that. Obviously, I haven't told this full story yet about the, the st- stuff being kept in customs. So the footballs are still in customs. That's what, ordered some footballs for the tournament. Um, long story short, didn't they arrived in Amsterdam two days before the tournament? Thanks, Ty. Didn't, they didn't come out, and this is due to this is due to Brexit and the extra th- steps you have to go through. Um, when I came back for the UK, it was still in cust- still on hold. So I phoned up and said, "Why?" Oh yes, you need to play the pay the eighty euros import. So that's nearly the cost of the balls. <laughs> so I've just left it, and I hope they, they're going to send them back. But from that, because I didn't have any balls for the tournament, I had to. I asked Klabu, um, yeah. their organisation in Amsterdam, who help work or work with sorry um, unregistered people, so your refugees, your asylum seekers, where they can come and they can eat and learn and do play sports. So I haven't met them. And they were going to put a team in. They sent some players to the tournament. I went back to the store and said, "Can I borrow some footballs?" And um, so that happened. Posted the video. Got some new network friends on LinkedIn. People that had seen it. Really? And there was a guy, guy who works for them as an intern, who saw me on Instagram, followed me, saw what I was doing, reached out and said, "See what you're doing. Would like to collaborate. Going to speak to people upline." Um, so had a, had a meet with him via Zoom and going to have another one. Um, so fingers crossed. Something is in, is in the making, but that just goes from a past chance. And so obviously I had to be in Amsterdam. Then I had to ride down a certain street. Then I had to make the decision to go and speak to people. And it just is the whole chain of events that just follows. Like, wow. I if I did, if it. I decided not to go for whatever reason, none of this would have happened. So the universe always rewards a trier. And, yeah. and the more we go on this journey with those little tiny wins along the way, you can't ignore that. And there will there will be L's or losses um, or learning mm-hmm. lessons, but you got to take it on the chin. And again, I harp on about herbal life. What that taught me, which I hadn't really done before, is to have a thick skin and um, manage your expectations, but also don't take things to heart. So when you get your nose, live for the nose. You're going to get nose. When you get that yes, that's what you live for. And now we. No, isn't even a no to me. It's just it's, a, it's an experiment. Okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? One of the um, consultants that worked for us um, was very successful on a, on our own desk, and then became a, a manager in the team and ran one of the pillars in the organisation. And uh, 
she recruited a lot of people and there was this one particular girl that had come from a semi-competitor that was an established recruiter, a smaller company, and she walked into this sort of boiler room sales floor um, with all our cons- all the team and consultants working. And it, it must have been overwhelming for her because she, she couldn't reproduce what she'd done before. And we we're all trying to get to the bottom of, you know, she had a great track record, she was doing so well, what's the problem, what's this, what's that? Uh, including myself, we all tried to support and help her because that's what the company was about, that, you know, you come on board, you join your family, everyone's here to support you and, and you know, get you closer to success as you see it. And I remember this uh, this girl took over because um, we all tried and we couldn't, we couldn't get her to that point of success. And she just said one simple thing. She set her a target in the morning and said, right, I want you to get 10 no's today. And the girl was looking at like, what are you talking about? And I, I clocked straight away what she's doing. I was like, that is amazing. Because now they're saying one no means you're one step close to the yes, right? Mm. So he, she set this new consultant with Target. Within six months, she was a top billion in the organization. Just because of that one little tweak, I'm going to incentivize you to get no's. So therefore, you're one step close to the yes. Take the heat, take the pressure off. Yeah. And she just picked up the phone off. She went, oh, there's another note. Well done, tick. Yeah. Take 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 it off. And then Love she it. hit a call. She hit a call. Yes, six she's, positions. She's experienced. She's con- she conditioned Boom. for it. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> now, wow, that is so powerful. So, yeah, definitely take a, a lesson from that, 100%. Brilliant stuff, Jay. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much, mate. We'll, let's shoot the breeze again sometime soon. We'll let, the mar- we'll let the market do what it's going to do. I don't do this normally. Um, I know Daniel Finch does it for his show. He puts a price stamp, so whatever price Bitcoin is at the time. And one of the episodes I did with him, I think Bitcoin was like £45,000, and I yeah. obviously since said it's been lower. I do a timestamp to say the Bitcoin blockchain. So whenever I record an episode, I put the blockchain height. I might just I might make a reference to the price right now and see where we are when this is released. It's obviously something to refer back to, but understand and learn about the block block chain height or block time height or time chain, whatever you want to call it. That will be relevant in the future, um, and it's just nice to to look at and have a reference to Bitcoin in all, in all the podcasts. And just yeah. just 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 for yeah. those audience members like me who don't understand what the hell you're talking about, <laughs> oh, sorry, what blockchain height? So every every block that's mined. Oh, as an, so as a ten thousand, right? Yeah, but it's you know, like so. Anyone geeky like me who watched Star Trek back in the day, Star yeah. the Captain's Log, and it was Star Date One Two Three Point, and no one knew what that means. Equally, you could argue that's like Bitcoin blockchain. So rather yeah. than say twelfth of December at seven PM, which is different everyone across the world, everyone lives on the same um, Bitcoin block height time. So whether you're in a South Africa, America, or UK, the block height is in, within the same. 10 minutes so yeah. when i timestamp something if someone puts that into their browser it gives them their local date and time so you could argue that bitcoin is now universal money and universal time with a block height so 2000 and 2023 ad is after jesus was born block height 811669 is that many blocks post the, the genesis block um third of gen 2009 yeah so, it, so everything, it, everything everything is either Post Genesis block or pre or a uh, pre Genesis block. I love it. Do it. I love it. Thanks for explaining it. That makes total sense. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I, in my head, I have the sort of what eight hundred and forty thousand will be the nearest to, near to the halving, and we're about that's what? right. Yeah, we're eight. I think what, we're about... eight one two eight, or maybe. Let's have a, let's have a quick look now, Ian, so, so yeah. we don't get it right. Um, I could have gone to mempool rather than type it. So if you go to mempool dot com or dot space, that shows you that how the Bitcoin blockchain works. Uh, we are now block height 813639. So 813,639 blocks have been mined so far in Bitcoin's history. So just to clarify to, to the listeners, if we can quickly do the math, um, we, we roughly reckon, let me get the math right here, 64 and 40, probably got about another 100 years of, Divided by so we got 100, 20, 100 plus, yeah, 100 plus. Yeah, so yeah. Say we've got 25 plus cycles at 210,000, and we're at eight just over 800,000 at the moment. What's quickly, what's 25? You always do that to me, it winds me up. 
my old boss used to do that, just throw numbers and say, what's that? And I'm like, what do I want to know? Is what he said? 25, yeah, yeah, 25, 25 times 200. 5 million, 250,000. Plus the 811,000. What? <laughs> Plus 811, roughly. 6 million and 61,000. Right, so as a percentage. I, I, I want to know, let me know, we're roughly about, we're roughly about 15%, just below, say, 13, 14% of the total blocks mined, right? Yeah. That gives no, you no, oh, yeah, people. total blocks mined, but out of total Bitcoin mined, we are 90% plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to confuse you even more. <laughs> yeah. But, but just to put that message out to everybody as a closing statement, so if we're 13% of the way into the total blocks sort of mined to the point of all Bitcoins being mined, yeah, That's but there will still be there, there will still be blocks after that, mind. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. But just to say, that's how early you are in the process. We're still early. That's another, that's another meme in the Bitcoin space. We're still right. early. We're still early. So because yeah. we are early, and we're at that point where properties are costing five thousand mm. pounds in London compared to what today. Do you want to buy a brick? <laughs> Don't sleep <laughs> on it. Start the journey. Yeah. And start yeah. your journey by understanding where we're coming from, which is a zeitgeist movie. And then follow that. Take some time to, to sort of take all that in because it's a lot. And it's a, it's a two-hour documentary, so maybe you want to do it in little pieces. Uh, zeitgeist movie, it's called. And then, once then, you then, you, then you're going to watch um, Breed Love's three-part series, Masters of Slaves and Money. Then you're going to watch Sailor's interview with Breed Love, What is Money, 10-part series. <laughs> Then you're going to visit my website and buy your tin hat. <laughs> you don't have to go that deep because I think there is a, we're now at a point where we can see a positive answer. But yeah, watching yeah. that in 2008 when it shattered my mind. But you, must, it, you must have, I say, blown your mind the fact that there weren't many people that were on the same wavelength. Well, I wish I'd made the link that you made so quick because if I'd have bought Bitcoin in 2008, <laughs> I would have probably bought the Genesis. Are you, block. You, sure you, are you sure you didn't invent it? Are you sure you're not Satoshi? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. We'll leave that one there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Just, say, just to Thank say, you. Boy, yeah. And then watch the, after you've done Zeitgeist, then watch the third industrial revolution. And for a bit of fun, um, watch Ready Player One, which gives us a good perception of the, the digital world that we may live in in the future once the meta serve, metaverse, sorry, not meta serve, metaverse takes place. And but that's much further down the line. Do, right? do you know when I watched that in Amsterdam, March 2020? Wow. And when I learned about Bitcoin in October, the first thing I did was message my cousin and said, Ready Player One was telling us what's going to happen. Thank why, you. Didn't I, why didn't I see it then in March when Bitcoin was $3,000? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And the other, fun, the other fun movie to watch, because they say that a lot of stuff is put in movies, which I totally believe in. Ryan Reynolds, fantastic guy. What he's doing down at Wrexham, phenomenal, right? Love to see that sort of from the ground up story. Um, great documentary on that on Netflix, actually, about, you know, the history of Wrexham and what it went through and how Ryan's come along now and they've got promotion. But, you know, Ryan Reynolds did a movie um, called The Free Guy. It's a real fun movie. But again, have a look at it. There's a lot. Yeah. Of did you, you mentioned that the other day, right? Did you yes. mention that to me? There's I a lot of subliminal that. messages. Two series movies, Zeitgeist and The Third Industrial Revolution by Jeremy Rifkin. And two fun movies giving you a picture of what the future may look like once we've had you know, the blockchain in play and the metaverse and everything else that's mm. going to come with it, gaming and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Ready Player One and The Free Guy. And just one more to throw out there. Um, we don't talk about watching TV because it's all fiat world, but I've just watched binge watched the series Bodies on Netflix with Stephen Graham. Okay. There are some connections, whether you can make it or not. I make them all the time with Bitcoin. So I put out there, to the Bitcoiners about anyone has anyone watched it because there's certain things in there you think yeah either the director produces a Bitcoiner or he's just eerily Bitcoin revolves around everything, everything revolves around Bitcoin <laughs> it's, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it it's there that slow process of just you know drip yeah. feeding the information so pick it up everybody and have some fun with it and go on a journey you'll have a great time and if that ends up like us being at a fantastic conference and meeting other people who are like minded you won't go on a better journey Definitely. All Thank right. you very much, Mr. Simpson. Catch up with you Bye. soon. All the best. Thank Take you very care. much. Look after yourself. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.